A study earlier this year found that following eight simple habits, you could extend your life expectancy by 24 years compared to none of those habits. The study was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in January 2024, and it was done on over 276,000 veterans aged 40 to 99. They identified eight habits that could increase life expectancy by 24 years. Never smoking, physical activity, no excessive alcohol, good sleep, nutrition, stress management, social connections, and no opioid use disorder. The more of these habits a person had, the greater their life expectancy was. Just one out of eight resulted in only 3.5 years, whereas four habits resulted in 9.7 years and seven habits resulted in 18.3 years. Those with eight factors had an 87% lower risk of mortality compared to those with zero factors, and thus their life expectancy was 24 years greater. The difference in life expectancy when adhering to these eight habits was greater at a younger age. At age four, 40, the difference in life expectancy between those adhering to 8 habits versus those who didn't was 24 years for males and 20.5 years for females. This means that the younger you begin with these healthy habits, the greater your likelihood of living longer. But don't worry, starting at any age is better than nothing at all. Even if you start in your 60s or 80s, you're still going to see greater improvements in your life expectancy compared to not starting. That's it, I could end the video right here. These simple 8 lifestyle habits can add decades to your life expectancy. However, I think we need more details. So in the rest of this video, I'm going to go through these 8 factors one by one to give some more details and more context. Make sure you click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. Number 1. Never smoking. It's been known for decades that smoking increases the risk of heart disease and cancer a lot. In observational studies, the risk of cardiovascular disease mortality among current smokers is anywhere between 100 to 400% higher compared to never smokers. When it comes to lung cancer, then the risk of lung cancer is 17,000% higher among heavy smokers who've smoked for decades compared to never smokers. We don't have randomized controlled trials proving that smoking causes heart disease or lung cancer. However, the increased risk of death seen in observational studies between smokers and never smokers is so big and so consistent that everyone pretty much accepts as fact that smoking causes those conditions. It would be just very hard to do this kind of long-term clinical trial. There's no safe amount of smoking. It's found that smoking a single cigarette a day increases the risk of heart disease by about 50% as much as smoking 20 cigarettes a day does. So if you think that smoking just a single cigarette per day is fine, then know that it's already 50% as dangerous as smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Fortunately, the earlier you stop smoking, the better it is. Smoking cessation before the age of 40 has been seen to reduce the excessive risk of death by 90%. Within a few years after smoking, your risk of heart disease and death is still elevated, but it drops down to almost normal levels after about 5 years. Even if you've been smoking for 30 to 40 years, cessation of smoking will reduce the risk of heart disease and death. But because you've been smoking for so many years, the damage has already been done and you can't completely repair it. Which is why the best scenario is to never smoke. And if you are smoking, then stop immediately. In this study, they categorized a person as either a never smoker or an ever smoker, meaning they've spent at least a portion of their life smoking regularly. This doesn't refer to having tried a cigarette a few times in your life, but more regular smoking, like for months and years. Number two, physical activity. We all know that exercise is good for slowing down the deterioration of the body and extending life expectancy. But what categorizes as being physically active in this study? In this study, they categorized a person as physically active if their physical activity was over or equal 7.5 met hours per week and they were categorized as sedentary if it was below 7.5 met hours per week. Met stands for metabolic equivalence, and one met equals 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute of VO2 max. If you jog at a speed of 8 kilometers, then that's the equivalent of 25 milliliters per kilogram per minute, or 7 met minutes. If you jog at this speed for an hour, you'll reach roughly 7.5 met hours per week. Alternatively, if you walk at a speed of 5 kilometers per hour, then to reach 7.5 met hours, you would need to walk 2 hours and 15 minutes. That's not a lot. To reach 7.5 hours, you would need to lift weights for 2 hours and 30 minutes. You would typically reach that by lifting 3 to 4 times per week. So as you can see, it's quite a low bar to reach 7.5 met hours per week of physical activity. Most people watching this already meet it. If you walk 45 minutes every day, lift weights 45 minutes 3 times a week, and jog for 30 minutes once a week, you're getting 28 met hours per week, which is significantly more than the criteria of this study. On the other hand, to be under 7.5 met hours per week of physical activity, you would have to be sedentary most days and not exercise at all. Number three, no excessive alcohol. Alcohol is an interesting topic 
joke as some people say that any amount of alcohol is harmful, whereas others think that a few drinks per week are actually better than no alcohol at all. However, the association between moderate alcohol consumption and reduced risk of mortality is often confounded by other variables, such as socioeconomic status, health status, or socializing. In the study, you got a point if you're either a never drinker or you typically drink no more than four drinks a day. You got a score of zero if you drink five or more drinks a day for males and four if you're a female. Now, four drinks a day is quite a lot. That means four beers or four glasses of wine per day. A 2018 analysis of 592 prospective and retrospective studies in 195 regions of the world found that the risk of all-cause mortality and cancers rises with increasing levels of consumption and the level of alcohol consumption that minimizes health loss is zero. This means that zero alcohol is better than any amount of alcohol, at least when consumed on a daily basis. Based on the veteran study, you could get away with a few drinks per day, but generally zero is healthier. Number four, restorative sleep. Sleep is obviously important. What constitutes as restorative sleep based on the veteran study? Restorative sleep meant sleeping seven to nine hours per day. So you got plus one if you do that and a score of zero if you don't. That fits also the other studies that find that the lowest risk of mortality is somewhere between seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Number five, good nutrition. Nutrition is also very controversial. My opinion about it is that what matters more is your blood work. Nutrition influences your blood work and the blood work is actually what determines the risk of these chronic diseases and death. Some foods are just more likely to result in better biomarkers than others, which is why you would want to eat mostly whole foods. In the study, you got a score of plus one if you were in the upper 40% of a healthy plant-based diet index, and you got a score of zero if you were at the lower 60%. Healthy plant food groups included whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, and tea or coffee. Unhealthy plant foods included fruit juices, sugar sweetened beverages, refined grains, potatoes, and sweets or desserts. To get to the upper 40% range, you would have had to consume these healthy plant foods over two to three servings per day and up to six plus servings per day. Number six, stress management. Chronic stress is going to increase the risk of hypertension and heart disease. In the study, they assessed a the person's stress levels with two questionnaires called Generalized Anxiety Disorder 2, GAD2, and Patient Health Questionnaire 2, PHQ2. GAD2 consists of two questions. Number one, over the last two weeks, have you felt anxious, nervous, or on the edge? A score of zero means not at all. A score of one equals several days. A score of two equals more than half of the days. And a score of three means nearly every Every day. The second question is over the last two weeks, have you felt trouble relaxing? Zero, not at all. One, several days. Two, more than half the days. Three, nearly every day. PHQ2 also consists of two questions. Number one, over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Zero, not at all. One, several days. Two, more than half the days. Three, nearly every day. And the second question is over the past two weeks, how often have you felt little interest or pleasure in doing things? Zero, not at all, plus one several days, plus two more than half the days, plus three nearly every day. In the study, you were categorized as having good stress management if your GAD2 and PHQ scores were both below three. This means that you might have felt stress or anxiety on some days, but not on all of the days. And most of the days, you didn't feel those things. If you got a score of three on these questionnaires, then it means you're under higher amounts of stress, which means that you didn't gain this plus one for the habit. Number seven, social connections. It's pretty established that poor mental health, social isolation, and loneliness can all have negative effects on your longevity, and they're associated with shorter lifespans. You might have heard that loneliness is as bad as smoking when it comes to the risk of heart disease. Is it true. Analyses of UK cohorts have found that social isolation isn't as strongly linked to death as smoking. However, the association is still quite strong. 94 to 144 percent increased risk for social isolation versus 170 to 216 percent for smoking. Loneliness was also linked to increased risk of all-cause mortality, but it was less than social isolation or smoking, 52 to 78 percent. So being socially isolated and feeling lonely isn't as bad as smoking, but it's still not a zero risk. In the veteran study, you got a plus one for this habit if your positive social interaction score was over 50 and zero if it was below 50. What does that mean? Essentially, people reported their availability of emotional support, affection, and amount of positive interactions on a scale of zero to 100 with zero being low score and 100 being the highest score. If the person scored over 50 on this, they gained an additional point that correlated with longer life expectancy. If a person scored less than 50, then they didn't get a point. 
You can even say that, okay, on a scale of 0 to 100, how many percentages would you give for your emotional and social support? 100 is that you have all the social support that you need, and 0 is that you don't have any of that. So 50% and higher is the sweet spot that you want to be. Number 8. No opioid use disorder. Opioids are a class of drugs used to relieve pain. A lot of people are addicted to them, especially in the United States, although European countries are also beginning to prescribe more and more opioids. Now, opioid use being associated with shorter lifespan could mean that people who have to take opioids are unhealthier or they suffer from some chronic conditions that cause pain. However, long-term opioid use can also have adverse effects on cognition, memory and motor control, which increases the risk of neurodegeneration and falling. In the study, they categorized people based on if they have opioid use disorder or not. So then what's categorized as opioid use disorder? It was defined as meeting the criteria for substance use disorder that results in marked distress and or impairment with two or more of the symptoms occurring in the past year. The symptoms are, number one, using the substance in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than intended. Number two, unsuccessful attempts or persistent desire to reduce use. Number three, too much time spent on obtaining, using and or recovering from the effects of the substance. Number four, a strong craving for the substance. Number five, significant interference interference with roles at work, school or home. Number six, continued use despite recurrent social or interpersonal consequences. Number seven, reducing or giving up important social, occupational or recreational activities because of the substance use. Number eight, substance use in situations in which it may be physically hazardous. Number nine, substance use despite recurrent or persistent physical or psychological consequences. Number 10, tolerance of the substance. And 11, withdrawal from the substance. If you meet two or more of these symptoms, then that can be diagnosed as substance use disorder. And in this study, it was referring to specifically opioids, which correlated to a shorter life expectancy. There you go. Here are the eight lifestyle factors that were found to be associated with up to two decades of greater life expectancy. I can actually do the calculations myself. Smoking, I'm a never smoker. Physical activity, I'm quite active and I exceed the 7.4 met hours per week. Alcohol, I don't drink alcohol so it's zero drinks per day. Number four, restorative sleep. I sleep seven to nine hours most nights. Number five, nutrition. I'm at the upper 40% of a healthy plant diet index. Number six, stress management. I don't experience almost any stress or anxiety, and I'm not very reactive to negative events. Number seven, social connections. I'm happily married, and I don't feel lonely. Number eight, opioid use disorder. I've never taken opioids, and I haven't taken any other drugs. So I got eight points, which is the maximum life expectancy based on this study. And I think most people watching this will also also get eight points quite easily. Check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, that walks you through 24 chapters on all different aspects of aging and longevity. You'll learn about nutrition, exercise, blood work, and supplements. Get The Longevity Leap from Amazon. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.